Okay. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. I'm Jeannie Krebs and I'm going to um, teach a lesson called the Soundscape Poetry Lesson. Um, this lesson is designed for a sixth grade general music class and you probably need about three class periods of time that are um, maybe 50 minutes to an hour long for each class period. Uh, it's a three-part lesson, um, so one part of the lesson for each class period. Um, some things that you'd need for materials, um, I'd have some poetry books or printed poems you could print out from some internet resources. Um, I included a list on the lesson plan of some of those. And um, a printout of the Soundscape lesson handout for students. And classroom instruments and any found sounds, um, any item that you could use to make sound for the Soundscape. Um, and that'll become evident as we kind of go through the lesson today. Um, you also need some blank paper for students to draw and take notes on. So um, the three parts of the lesson, um, the first one is just kind of an introduction to free verse poetry so the students can hear some of that and know what it is. And the second part of the lesson, um, the students are going to write their own free verse poem based on Lakota values. And the third part of the lesson, students are going to um, improvise and compose a soundscape that is going to be performed while their poem gets recited. And I'm going to get started with part one, the introductory lesson. Um, at the beginning of this class, I would um, let students know that we're going to be just doing some listening of poems to start off with. Um, students are going to listen and reflect on poetry that has been written by other kids. And um, I would read this aloud. And the poems that I'm going to read to you today are from a book called Walking on Earth and Touching the Sky. This is a collection of writings by Lakota youth at the Red Cloud Indian School. Um, to encourage active listening with the students, I would give them some blank paper and invite the students to draw a picture or a scene that would express the words and the meaning of the poem that they're listening to as I read it out loud. So once they have their paper and um, colored pencils or, or maybe just a pencil to sketch with, I would read some poems from um, the collection uh, from the Red Cloud Indian School. So I'm gonna read a few of those for you right now and a couple short ones and, and another long one. The first poem I'm going to read to you is called Circle and this was written by Raymond Ghost Bear. Um, as I read, remember to take notes or draw a picture of the scene um, that the words of the poem bring to mind. Circle. A circle is a connecting line at all times. A circle has no ends. A circle is round. The world is a circle. Our life travels with a circle. A circle is strong, strong enough to hold together a tribe. And then I would pause and give students a moment to, to create their sketch or their drawing. Then um, I'm going to move on to um, another poem. This one is written by Derek McCauley. And the name of this poem is Nature. Nature, the sky is my mom watching over me. The water is my memories to be. Nature is my home and family. And I'm going to read one more poem for you. The name of this poem is called All of My Relatives. It's by Kathy McLaughlin. All of my relatives are like the wild prairies, different sizes that are old and new. We are like the stars. There are a great many of us. We are like the sea. We have many voices. We are like the skies, always changing from beautiful to ugly and mean. Some of us are like the trees, very old and wise. The rest of us are like flowers, still young and learning. And so I would let the students have some time to kind of sketch out those drawings in between each poem so they could really think about what they had just heard. 
um, once they have kind of sketched that out, then I would um, let them know what today's objectives are after they've completed that kind of introduction. So the objectives are today we will listen to some different types of poetry and which we've just done and we're going to find musical sounds that will bring up the expression of poems. I'm going to ask you to choose your own poem now and I would at this point I provide students with books of poetry or printed poems from internet resources so they could actually have um, some choices as to what poem they may want to use for today. So um, once you've decided on a poem um, and you read it out loud, I'm going to ask you to find a partner to pair with. And uh, at, for this, uh, this particular lesson, I'd let students choose their own partner so um, that they would feel comfortable sharing the poem with them. Um, choose the poem you wish to read aloud and take take the time to look through poetry books the books that we've provided and the printouts and once they have selected their poem and read it to their partner then we're going to move to the next step of the lesson and that's creating a soundscape and so to define what is a soundscape a soundscape is a musical improvisation created to enhance the reading or of a story or a poem. So we have a poem in this case. And right now, um, this is when I would demonstrate for the students what a soundscape is, okay? And a soundscape is um, an audio of uh, that somebody could listen to while the poem is being read. And the idea that this is, uh, this is an art form that is to be listened to, not something that would be watched on a video, but something that they would just hear. Um, maybe you would find podcasts with soundscape poetry, um, those kinds of things. So right now I would play um, an example of a poem that has a soundscape. Phoenix, a poem about courage by Mark Elam. You just made another mistake. Hey, that's okay. Be brave and make some more. Manage risk. Then keep taking more. As you strive, seek God, love big, believe in good, do your very best, and when you err, be a phoenix. Shake the ashes off your wings and soar once more upon imperfect skies. And then once we've listened to that example um, and they kind of get the idea of what a soundscape poem could be, um, we're going to start creating our own soundscape. Um, so here's some instruments and some found sounds that I just kind of set out today. Um, some of these are actually used in the listening example that you just heard. Um, and so you can use classroom instruments or what I call found sounds, which is just stuff that you find lying around. Um, I also encourage students to, to create sounds with their voices, but not using text or words because these sounds are going to be the background, the accompaniment to the poem being read. Um, so right now I'll just kind of show you a couple of the things that I have sitting out here. Um, I've got a ukulele and uh, a drum, a doombeck. 
for the paper. This is more of a found sound. You can get a good sound from scrunching up paper. Um, some bells, um, little symbols. I even set out a, a couple things you can find laying around. Sandpaper. Um, pots and pan lids are always great for making noises and sounds for a soundscape. Um, more traditional things like a triangle or um, a tambourine. Um, red castanets. Um, maracas. And shakers are always good. A student favorite, the pop bottle. Um, I even put, I have a bowl with dried beans, um, sounds that you can get from shaking things. Uh, this could also be a good time to, to um, encourage students to maybe invent a percussion instrument um, if you don't have a lot of resources for students to work with. So I would give them some time to experiment with the different sounds. And I would also encourage students to not just play the instrument in the traditional way that you would play it, but maybe think of different sounds that an instrument could make that the instrument wasn't necessarily built for. So they could come up with a lot of interesting sounds that way too. Um, and so students would take some time um, experiment, improvise, and get an idea of what sounds are available to them. If they didn't have a sound that they wanted, you could encourage them to bring that into class the next time. Um, and once they have their sounds picked out and they are going to create that soundscape to go along with their poem. Um, let's see. Um, as the students um, go off with their partner, um, I'd give them a space in the classroom, or I've, I've had kids go out in the hallway, like a pair of students, um, even students working in a closet space so they could um, make sounds and not necessarily have to listen to the whole class, and try to give some students some space if you're able to. Uh, one student will read the poem and the other student will play the soundscape at the same time. And so today, students have picked, their, picked a poem that somebody else wrote out of a book or a, or a print off, and they, their partner reads it out loud, and they are gonna perform the soundscape. When I do this, I want the performers to be behind the audience. The audience is not going to watch them perform. As a matter of fact, I would just have um, the listeners in the class even close their eyes to listen, and the performers would be behind them. The idea is that it's an audio experience, and so they're not watching it, they're just listening, which tends to provide a little more meaning and depth for the listeners. So um, I would remind the observing students that any sounds that they make or if they giggle or laugh that that's going to become part of the soundscape so um, encouraging an atmosphere of respect and to be um, thoughtful while their while their um, peers perform their soundscape and poem and so that would conclude the first part of the lesson the the first class period so each student would get a chance to experiment improvise a little bit and when you got done, students would know what is a soundscape. And they would also have um, heard and read uh, poems from various sources. And the next time that they came to class, we would do part two of the lesson. And this is where they are going to write their own poem based on the Lakota value. When students come in, I would say today we're going to listen to Lakota Virtues and look for some connection and inspiration for creating your own poem today. You'll be writing your own poem based on one of these Lakota values. And so I would, at this time, I'm going to give students the handout that's um, attached on the email here. And each student will have their own handout and um, have a pencil ready. Please listen thoughtfully as I read aloud an interpretation of these values and think about how you, how you have experienced or been taught any of these values in your family. 
The interpretation I'm going to read today is from the Atka Lakota Cultural Center. And as I read, make notes or you can draw pictures on the handout um, next to each one, of, each one of these values on the list. Um, the notes and pictures should express what each of these values mean to you or how it might connect to your own values. And so right now I'm going to read this reading for you. Um, and this is um, on four Lakota values. Um, I did not use such a wide range, but kept it to four. So students can be very thoughtful when they're listening and um, maybe have an easier time choosing one to be the focus for today. So right now I would just have students listening as I read aloud. Generosity means to contribute to the well-being of one's people and all life by sharing and giving freely. This sharing is not just of objects and possessions, but of emotions like sympathy, compassion, kindness. It also means to be generous with one's personal time. The act of giving and not looking for anything in return can make you a better person and make you happy. Giveaways have always been part of Lakota society. At important events, the family gathers their belongings and sets them out for any person in the community to take. What you give away, you keep. What you keep, you lose. This is an old Lakota saying. No matter what race or nationality or tribe people have found, when you reach out to help each other in your community, you become less focused on yourself and more in harmony with the world. This is generosity. And I would pause and let students finish their notes and their drawings. All right, the next value on your handout is kinship. Kinship is one of the important values coming from the extended family. It includes the ideas of living in harmony, belonging, and relations as true wealth, the importance in trusting in others. It is one of the values that make the extended family work. Family is the measure of your wealth. They will support you in good times and in bads and in, in bad times. For a Lakota, you belong to an extended family through birth, marriage, or adoption. Your family even extends to you out to your band and the whole Lakota nation. Whenever you travel somewhere, you, you can expect to be welcomed and supported as if you were in your own immediate family. In traditional Lakota society, kinship was a little different from what it is today. The Lakota were a warrior and hunting society. This meant that the men might not return when they went out to fight or hunt. So the network of relatives ensured the women, children, and elders would not be left alone. In these times, generosity was the way of life and resources were meant to be shared. This is the value of kinship. And then the next one is fortitude. Fortitude means, face, means facing danger or challenges with courage, strength, and confidence. Believing in oneself allows a person to face challenges. Fortitude includes the ability to come to terms with problems, to accept them, and to find a solution that is good for everyone. One of the first lessons a Lakota child learned in the old days was self-control and self-restraint in the presence of parents or adults. Mastery and abilities came from games and creative play. Someone more skilled than oneself was, view, was viewed as being a role model, not as a competitor. Striving was for achieving a personal goal, not for being superior to one's opponent. Success was a possession of the many, not of the few. Fortitude may require patience, perseverance, and strength of mind in the face of challenges. It involves having confidence in oneself and the courage to continue even when all odds are against you. Fear still exists, but you proceed in spite of fear. This is the value of fortitude. And the last one on your list there is wisdom. The knowledge and wisdom of old people is very important for the well-being of the Lakota people. This is understood to be something sought and gained over the course of one's entire life, but not just by adding years to one's life. Wisdom has to do with understanding the meaning within the natural processes and patterns. 
It means knowing the design and purpose of life. It also has to do with the understanding and living the spiritual values and beliefs upon which one's culture is founded and being able to share these with others. Wisdom means being able to incorporate the sacred way of life into one's own life and to respect and honor all life. It means being open to the dreams of the day and the night when the spiritual direction may come to a receptive child or adult seeking wisdom. This is the value of wisdom. And at, at, at this time, I allow students um, the opportunity to finish any notes or drawings that they were doing on the handout. <clears throat> Take the time to look through your notes and pictures. Now choose one of these values that resonated with you the most. This is going to be the start or the main focus of your poem. Uh, to start writing your poem, um, we're going to do a couple things. Right now, I want you to take your pen and paper, and we're going to write freely and nonstop for five minutes with no talking and no sound. And do not lift your pen from the paper. Just keep writing. These are going to be ideas that you're going to use when you craft your poem. This is not your poem. And then I would allow the students the five minutes to write. Once again, thinking of your um, value that you chose from the list, right now I would have you list as many words that you can that tell about the value that you chose. And then the final um, activity, I would have them share a short story with your partner and tell about a time when you or someone you knew experience this value in their lives. What happened and why was it important? And for students that um, benefit from the, from the time and the opportunity to draw or sketch, um, I would have students draw a picture of how that value could be realized in their life today. Once they have these, all these things about the value that they've selected, um, I, I would get them started on their poem. Now that you have this material to work with, write your poem. This poem can be as long or as short as you wish, as long as it carries the meaning that you're trying to express. And the poem can be free verse, and this means that the poem does not need to rhyme. The examples of poems that we listened to earlier, um, they were uh, free verse poems, so there was no rhyming, um, there's no set cadence. Um, it's a free verse poem, so it gives you a lot of freedom, and this also gives students a lot of choices, too. For the student that um, can say things with fewer words, um, or maybe a student that struggles with writing, it might be a way that they can still be expressive um, and not have to stress over um, trying to come up with a page worth of material. Um, for the, uh, the assessment part of this lesson, um, I would have students self-edit their poem. Um, I would instruct the students um, when their poem, when they felt like it was ready, I would tell them that it's time to edit their poem. Um, I would ask them to make any changes that help to give it meaning and significance. Um, in order to self-edit the poem, uh, it was important that the students hear the poem aloud. So I would have them read it aloud themselves so they can hear themselves say the words. And then also have a partner read their poem back to them so they could really hear what it sounded like. Um, I would ask students to consider their word choice. Um, is there a word that might better exemplify the meaning of the poem or enhance the sound or the flow, the cadence of the poem? And then once they've done those things and self-edited the poem, I would ask the student to read the poem to the teacher, to read it to me. And that would end the second part of the lesson. Um, when they returned to the next class period, we would take this poem and um, the objective for the third part of the lesson would be to improvise the soundscape for the poem, just like we did on the very first uh, part of the lesson with somebody else's poem, but this time they're going to do it with their own poem. And students will perform their own poem and their soundscape for the class, but they're going to need a partner because the partner will do the reading of the poem. The student that wrote the poem will perform the soundscape while their partner reads it. Uh, once again, I would put the performers at the back of the class 
so that students are not watching them. Um, the audience is a listening audience. Um, they could be invited to close their eyes and listen while um, the performance is happening. Um, uh, kind of the technology integration of this part, um, I would have students audio record these performances so that they could hear it themselves. Um, and, and also, if your if your class has a class website. Um, they can upload these onto the class website so they can be shared with their family and with their friends. I would have students begin this last day of class on the Soundscape poems um, by reading the poem aloud again, so just so they could get it back in their mind. And, um, and then I would direct them to take a look at the instruments, experiment again, um, try different things with their partner reading. Maybe they want their partner to pause at a certain time so they can get a little extra sound in there. Or maybe they're gonna play while the partner is reading and reminding students that they don't wanna drown out the sound of the reader, that they are an accompaniment to them. Um, so they could play in the spaces in the poem when it's being read or as the background. So, but the poem and the soundscape are one performance in the same. So we need to hear both of those. Um, I would give students that opportunity to practice a little bit, revise, experiment with the music, and then they could perform for the class. Um, you might even set aside a different day for a performance and um, have the audio equipment set up to record and I like to put students in charge of doing the recording and doing the uploading so that they can get some practice with that too. Um, at the conclusion of the performance um, I would ask the students to explain to me the teacher they could do it in writing or if they prefer in a storytelling fashion where they could explain to me why they chose that particular Lakota value to write their poem about. Um, and this concludes the, our lesson today on the soundscape poetry. Um, and you can uh, see all the references and um, the particulars on the lesson plan that's submitted in the email. Thank you.